Hello everyone, thank you for joining today's webinar on the Killer Heat Report Briefing. My name is Kara Cook and I'm the Climate Change Program Coordinator for the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. This webinar is hosted by Annie's Global Nurses Climate Change Committee. And on this webinar, we'll, we'll um, receive a briefing of the newly released report by the Union of Concerned Scientists, Killer Heat in the United States, Climate Choices and the Future of Dangerously Hot Days. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items I just wanna go over. We'll take questions at the end of the presentation. You can enter a question at any time um, during the, the webinar presentation by entering it at, into the chat box in the um, bottom left-hand corner of the screen. This webinar is being recorded and a link will be sent out um, to the Climate Change Committee listserv as well as to those who registered for the webinar. We will also be sending out um, the slides along with the recording. We will be offering one nursing continuing education for um, viewing this webinar. A link to complete an evaluation will be sent out by email tomorrow. You must complete the evaluation to receive the nursing continuing education. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our Climate Change Committee co-chair, Dr. Carol Zeger, to kick us off. Hey, well, first of all, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited about this opportunity um, to hear this presentation. And this is our normal, um, our regular meeting time. So we just wanted to share with the regular members of the Climate Change Committee. We're going to send out an email with an update on the business that we discussed at the last meeting. Um, share shortly, probably tomorrow or early next week. Um, and so that's how we're going to sort of follow up on the business. Um, the next meeting is going to be September 19th, same time from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern. You're all, please, uh, we encourage all of you to attend. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and kick off the webinar, if that's all right. I'm going to introduce the speakers. We're so thrilled to have two um, speakers from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Juan Declit Barreto is a climate scientist for Union of Concerned Scientists Climate and Ener Energy Program. He partners with environmental justice groups and activists to research the potential effects of the carbon trading on disadvantaged communities. His research maps analyzes and finds he, he, he research maps analyzes and finds solutions to the unequal human health and livelihood impacts of environmental hazards, particularly those exacerbated by climate change. And Christy Dahl is a senior climate scientist for UCS who designs, executes, and communicates scientific analyses that make climate change more tangible to the general public and policymakers. Her research focuses on the impacts of climate change, particularly sea level rise on people and the places and institutions that they care about. Dr. Dahl holds a, holds a PhD in paleoclimate from the MIT WHOI Joint Program in Cambridge and Woods Hole, Massachusetts. So thank you so much for being here and I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers. Thank you so much. This is Christy Dahl. I'm really excited to talk with all of you about our Killer Heat Report, which was released last month. Um, in part because we focused a lot on the potential health effects of this extreme heat. And so we are eager to get this kind of information in the hands of healthcare um, professionals like yourselves and to learn more from you about how we can build on this work in the future. Um, just need to advance the slide here. Quick hand. There we go. For those of you who aren't familiar with UCS, we are a national advocacy organization that aims to do rigorous science that can be put into action to build a healthier planet and a safer world. So we have about 200 to 250 people on staff. That includes scientists like Juan and myself and analysts who um, are more policy focused. But we also work with a network of scientists that has over 25,000 members. These are people with advanced degrees in scientific fields who help to get um, science-based policies talked about and enacted throughout the country. We really value the expertise of communities and professional groups like yours. Um, and we're excited to work with both scientists and non-scientists to advocate for change. In terms of why we wanted to focus on extreme heat, we know that, that um, heat waves have a major effect on human health. So as we recently experienced across much of the US in July, extreme heat can be dangerous and even deadly. Uh, when people are exposed to extreme heat, and so I'm sure you are all familiar with, can cause heat cramps, 
heat exhaustion, and even heat stroke. The longer people are exposed, the greater the risks are to, to their health. One of the things that we noted during this recent heat wave was a quote by an emergency room physician in Michigan who said, we've seen a huge spike in ER visits and admissions in the past several weeks, huge. We've been admitting people left and right. Each year, the CDC estimates that about 600 people in the US die of heat-related causes, um, but it's likely that heat contributes to many more incidents of heat-related illness each year. We know from looking at historical trends that extreme heat is getting worse. It's becoming both more frequent and more severe. And it's on track to get a whole lot more extreme just in our lifetime. So we wanted people to be able to see this coming and to have a chance to take action to steer a future in a different direction. So um, last month we released this Killer Heat Report and, a and published a peer-reviewed article in the journal Environmental Research Communications along with it. So I'll be giving you an overview of what we did and what we found. Sorry, I'm just a little slow to advance the slides here. Okay. So our killer heat analysis took high resolution climate model data. We used data from 18 different climate models so that we could create an average and, and not have a bias for any one climate model. Um, and we used the temperature and humidity information from those models to calculate a heat index, which is what the National Weather Service tends to use as the basis for issuing heat advisories and alerts to the general public. Um, we we projected what the heat index would be like in the future, um, and then looked at the number of days that would fall above different heat index thresholds that are relevant to human health. We looked at three different future scenarios that account for um, the range of uh, emissions growth we could see in our heat trapping emissions like carbon dioxide, um, because there is uncertainty about how our emissions will grow over the course of this century. We wanted to look at a range of different outcomes. And we also provide data for every community in the lower 48. So this study addressed a couple of gaps that existed in the literature that was out there on extreme heat. First, we noticed that there was a, a lack of information about combined temperature humidity projections. As I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, the, our experience of heat is related to temperature, of course, but it's also related to humidity um, because as the humidity arises, it inhibits our body's abilities to cool themselves by sweating. But there weren't really any studies that looked at these combined temperature humidity projections in terms that um, the general public would be familiar with. We had also noticed that there was a lack of very fine-scaled information that communities would need to be able to plan um, for coping with more extreme heat in the future. So by looking at these very high-resolution climate models and then um, distilling it down so that there, we could provide data for every community, we hope that we're providing information that's useful at the community level. Um, I want to talk a bit about what the heat index is, so most of you are probably familiar with this. So this is a chart that is based off of a chart that was developed by the National Weather Service. Um, and you can see temperature values along the top row and humidity values along the leftmost column. The, the, and then the heat index is shown in the colored boxes. So what you can see is that, for example, with a temperature of 90 degrees, um, if the relative humidity is low, say 40%, the heat index or the feels like temperature is about 91 degrees. So that's what that, those conditions would feel like to your body. But with higher humidity, say 70%, that 90 degree temperature reading on your thermometer would actually feel to your body more like 105 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is again reflecting the fact that as humidity rises, it's harder and harder for our bodies to cool themselves by sweating. You we'll also notice in this chart that there's this big black zone over on the right that's labeled off the charts. 
So this was something that was innovative in our study that we don't think anyone has looked at in the past. When the heat index was originally formulated, it was formulated for the range of temperature and humidity conditions that we have tended to see historically on Earth. And so these conditions that are extremely hot and or extremely humid are, are rare today. Um, they only occur in the US in the Sonoran Desert region, which is along the boundary of um, Southern California and Arizona. But as we start warming our Earth more and more, we will increasingly see conditions that fall um, into this zone that's in the black. And at these levels, we can't reliably calculate the heat index because the heat index wasn't formulated for those types of conditions. In terms of the future scenarios that we looked at, as I mentioned, we looked at three different scenarios for how our um, carbon emissions would grow between now and 2100. So you can see the three colored lines here. The red is what we call the no action scenario. This is a scenario in which our um, heat trapping emissions continue to rise through the end of the century. And by the end of the century, that would cause a global warming of about 7.7 .7 degrees Fahrenheit. We also looked at a slow action scenario that's shown in the yellow. And this is a scenario in which our emissions continue to rise through about the year 2050 and then decline rapidly after that. And that leads to a global warming of about 4.3 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. And we looked at a rapid action scenario. So this is a scenario in which we start to reduce our heat trapping emissions swiftly in the very near future. And we're able to limit warming to um, about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit or two degrees Celsius. And that's in line with the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement that um, most countries in the world, with the exception of the US, has subscribed to. So we see very different um, outcomes in terms of the frequency of extreme heat, depending on which scenario we're looking at. If we take a look at how conditions would evolve um, by mid-century, what we're looking at here is the average number of days above different heat index thresholds for the historical period on the left, those uh, the historical maps are on the left, and the mid-century period, which reflects a 30-year average between 2036 and 2065. Um, and we're looking in this case for that, those mid-century numbers that are no action scenario. The top row shows the number of days with a heat index above 100, and the bottom row shows the number of days with a heat index above 105. So what we can see when we compare, let's take a look just at the, um, at the the top row, for example, um, the 100 degree days, is that when we compare the historical and the mid-century, we see a major expansion in the extent of the country that experiences um, days with a heat index of 100 degrees or more on a regular basis. Um, and we also see that places that are familiar with that level of heat today, for example, Texas, um, start to see much more frequent heat at that level. So uh, for example, Texas, that southwestern corner of Texas today might see between 25 and um, 50 days with a heat index above 100, um, whereas by mid-century, they could be seeing between 100 and 200 such days. Um, overall, we found that nationwide, the number of days with a heat index above 100 would double between now and mid-century with no action to reduce emissions. And the number of days with a heat index above 105 would quadruple. Um, if we focus for a moment on those days with a heat index above 105, or the lower, um, the lower row on this uh, figure, what that means is that for places like Raleigh, North Carolina, that have experienced about three days with a heat index above 105 historically, by mid-century, they could be seeing 26 days per year. So that's going from just a small handful to nearly a month per year with those conditions. 
Um, similarly for Austin, Texas, they currently experience about five days per year with a heat index of 105, but that would increase to nearly two months per year by mid-century. So both in terms of the frequency um, of the uh, heat at these levels and the intensity of the heat, we see major increases just within the next uh, 30 or 40 years. If we look at um, how that would play out in terms of cities that would be experiencing um, regular extreme heat, what I'm showing here is a map with um, cities that would experience 30 days or more per year with a heat index above 105. Um, and again, this is for mid-century. The, the places that experience this level of heat and this frequency of heat today are only found um, in Southern California and Arizona. Those are the three cities that kind of look like target symbols. Um, so today, historically, only three cities experience 30 or more days per year with a heat index above 105. By mid-century, that would expand to about 150 cities um, nationwide, and as far north as places like um, Northern Missouri. All of the places in the small black dots are places that experience fewer than 30 days of this level of heat per year, even by that mid-century timeframe. When we look at the late century timeframe, and what I mean by that is the last 30 years of this century, if we fail to take action to reduce our emissions, we'd be looking at unprecedented levels of heat throughout much of the country. So here we're looking at, in the top uh, map, the number of days per year with a heat index above 105. And in the bottom map, the number of days with off the charts conditions. So again, these are conditions that fall um, above the upper bounds of the National Weather Service's heat index scale where we can't reliably calculate a heat index. Um, we found that by late century, we could have as, about eight times as many days nationally with a heat index above 105 as we have historically. Um, and whereas historically, these off the charts conditions have affected less than 1% of the US, and as I mentioned, just the area in the Sonoran Desert, by late century with no action to reduce emissions, about 60% of the US by area would experience these off the charts conditions at least once a year. That amounts to about 120 million people across the country that would be experiencing seven or more days of this off the charts heat in an average year um, compared to less than 2000 today. So right now we have very few people in the country who are familiar with this level of heat. Um, but if we fail to take action to reduce emissions, more than a third of our population um, not assuming any population growth, would experience a week or more of those off-the-charts conditions. The good news is that we found that taking action now and pursuing that um, rapid action scenario that I had outlined um, could lead to a, um, a limitation in the amount of extreme heat that we experience in the future. So if we compare late century conditions, um, here on the left, we're looking at cities that would experience 30 or more days with a heat index above 105 with the no action scenario where we've continued to let emissions grow. And on the right, um, cities that would experience that level of heat if we pursued the rapid action scenario. So again, there are only three cities historically that have experienced these conditions. If we allow our emissions to continue growing, we end up in late century having uh, about 290 cities that would have 30 or more days with a heat index above 105. Those cities are as far north as Michigan. You know, these are not places that we tend to think of as having um, a month or more of um, a heat index above 105. In contrast, if we take rapid action to reduce our emissions, that number of cities affected drops to just 85. So that's a far cry from the three cities that experience that level of heat today. But by making those changes, more than 200 cities across the country could avoid this fate. 
So a few takeaways um, from our report. The first is that failing to take action to reduce emissions would lead to a staggering expansion of dangerous heat. But if we aggressively reduce our emissions, we could contain that expansion. We have a very narrow window of time in which to act to limit future warming and future heat extremes. And so the time to act on this is now. If you're curious to get more information or dig more into this data, we have a, a whole bunch of tools that um, let you do that in a variety of ways. All of them can be found on our website. The link is up here. It's ucsusa.org slash killer heat. And if you go to that website, you'll find a link to interactive maps that let you click on a given county, wherever you want to um, explore. And you can get statistics for that county about um, you know, how many days per year with heat effects above different levels you would have in the future. And you can explore those different emission scenarios as well. You'll also find at that website an interactive data widget where you can type in your location or any location you're interested in, um, choose how hot you want to, um, to look at, whether it stays above 100 or above 105 or off the charts. And um, you can see how um, the number of those days would evolve in the future with no action to reduce emissions versus with rapid action. Um, we also have spreadsheets with all the data um, that you're welcome to download from that website and fact sheets for every single congressional district in the country, both in English and in Spanish, if you're interested in taking this information to your representatives. So with that, I'll turn it over to Juan to talk more about the public health implications of extreme heat. Um, great. Juan? Thank you, Christy. Um, uh, well, I'm really excited uh, to be here to share uh, with you some of these public health implications of extreme heat. Um, I am married to a, to a nurse who is a, a nurse at the uh, National Institutes of Health. So I think so. I think that nurses are awesome, of course, and I think it's a really important uh, group of, of trusted medical professionals to talk to about climate change since people put so much trust in your judgment. Um, so with that, I'd like to start with, let me bring the next, okay, the next slide. Um, to talk about what are some of the uh, health impacts uh, on people um, when we reach some of these uh, thresholds of, of heat index that Christy has been talking about. So when we have a uh, heat index um, as low as say 80 Fahrenheit, that can affect human health. Um, extreme heat exposure can affect people very differently depending on their health and their environment. And certain groups of people may become more susceptible to heat related illnesses as the heat index rises. People who are exposed to conditions with very high to extremely high heat indices have an increased risk of dehydration and heat exhaustion, as you might expect, because they spend more time outdoors in hot places and lack access to water or facilities that could otherwise be used to keep cool and hydrated. So as the heat index rises, more and more people become susceptible to heat-related illness. Um, on, the, on the chart here, uh, on the left, at 90 Fahrenheit, outdoor workers become more, more susceptible. So this, this is generally uh, the danger zone with that, that starts with for people who work outdoors. When the heat index uh, hits 100, um, uh, especially vulnerable populations such as children, elderly adults, pregnant women, and people with underlying medical conditions become more uh, at higher risk of heat-related illness. When we reach the 100 or exceed the 105 uh, heat index threshold, anyone who is outside for a a um, uh, prolonged amount of time could be impacted by, by heat, could, could be at risk of a heat-related illness or even death. And when we get into the territory of the, um, of the, of the, of the charts, uh, heat index, um, this is an undetermined level of risk. You know, any level of exposure is presumed to be extremely dangerous because at this point, like Christy pointed out, the National Weather Service and public health agencies um, lose the ability to accurately communicate to the public uh, what the risks of extreme heat are. The symptoms shown here, ranging from minor annoyances to truly life-threatening issues, include both those that are indicative of heat-related illnesses and those that are signs of pre-existing conditions that can be exacerbated to extreme heat. So they run, they, they, they run the range from minor annoyances like head, like headaches or dizziness or availability to injury to uh, to organs such as the liver and kidneys uh, that that can lead um, to to heat strokes or death. 
So one of the things that, that we focused on was to try to understand how certain vulnerable populations could be impacted um, by, by these um, high uh, heat index uh, values. Um, currently, counties with large African-American populations, as you see in this graph, are exposed to extreme temperatures. Oops, sorry. There we go. To extreme heat um, temperatures two to three more days per year than counties with uh, smaller African-American populations. And what we found is that by mid-century, the expectation is that those same counties would experience about 20 more extreme heat days per year. The historical data that we looked at also showed that African-Americans have been disproportionately affected by extreme heat. About 40% of the total U.S. African-American population versus 30% of the U.S. general population will be affected. So there's definitely a disparity in the historical and the projected um, uh, impacts that African Americans um, are expected to face um, if, if, if no action is taken. And we also uh, took a look at what does a no action scenario, no climate action scenario looks like by mid-century for counties with large Latino populations. The counties in either of the two shades of pink here in this map um, are indicative of those counties who could experience 100 or more days with the heat index above 100. The title actually should say 100, no 105. But you can see that areas in southwestern Arizona, um, southern Texas, parts of Louisiana, Oklahoma, and even Arkansas, as well as southern Florida, could experience a large number of killer heat days. So let's talk about what we can do about it. Let's talk about some of the good news and the things that we can do about it. There are two main paths to, to or rubrics to protect ourselves from climate change and extreme heat. On the one side, on the one hand, we need mitigation. We need mitigation of carbon emissions that are warming the planet. We need large scale um, governmental action together with the private sector and with all sectors of society um, at all scales of governance to mitigate the emissions that are warming the planet. But we also need to adapt to keep people safe from the heat. So let's go a little bit into what those uh, may entail. On the mitigation side, we need to transition our energy and transportation systems away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy, such as solar and wind. We also need to move towards cleaner vehicles as well. So some of the things that can be done at the, at the international level by the United States are, for example, to stay in the Paris Agreement. The Trump administration has indicated its intent to remove the United States from the Paris Agreement, um, which is something that they uh, cannot actually be done until after 2020, but just signaling to the rest of the world the intention to remove the country from uh, its climate change obligations sends a very bad signal to the rest of the world that the U.S. is not taking its um, carbon emissions um, uh, obligations seriously. So the United States really should be staying and implementing um, uh, its obligations under the Paris Agreement. On the domestic side, one of the most um, uh, one, one, one of the um, um, ways of reducing the um, large carbon emissions footprint of the United States is for the United for the United States Environmental Protection Agency to uh, implement the Clean Power Plan, which is a plan to reduce emissions from the power sector, which accounts for roughly 40% of the United States uh, um, carbon footprint. And that, is, that uh, car, uh, Clean Power Plan, unfortunately, is um, being dismantled by the Environmental Protection Agency, and it's something that we urge um, the, the Trump administration to not do. There's also a need to build a clean energy economy to transition um, to other um, uh, sources of, of energy to uh, jumpstart um, clean energy economy for disadvantaged communities to promote solar panel construction and installations um, and, and things like that. Um, when we then go back to the um, adaptation part of keeping people safe, um, there are a number of actions that, um, that need to uh, happen or that are in various stages of happening at the federal and local levels, such as an improved heat early warning system um, to be able um, to give the ability to public health um, practitioners at all uh, levels, especially county and state, to uh, monitor 
um, the heat season to start um, uh, implementing their, um, uh, their their plans for monitoring vulnerable populations and prevent heat illnesses and death. To develop state and local heat adaptation and emergency response plans to adopt cooling standards for public housing. There's also a need for investments in community cooling, infrastructure, trees, shading, and cool roofs um, that can help mitigate some of the local um, uh, conditions that exacerbate um, extreme heat in cities such as the urban heat island, which we know affect more vulnerable populations disproportionately. There's also um, some bail assistance program for low-income um, households to um, help them help them pay for um, cooling infrastructure, such as, such as the purchase of an air conditioning unit or the power bill for its operation. Some of these programs in different states um, are implemented differently in different states, I should say. And they, um, m many um, community advocates say that they do not cover all the needs for, um, for, for many vulnerable populations. So there's certainly a need to uh, improve those um, uh, cooling assistance programs, especially for low-income folks. We also need to have investments in heat and climate smart infrastructure to protect us against um, extreme heat in the future. And there is certainly a need to reform utility disconnection policies, uh, which largely already exist for uh, during during the um, during the winter season that prevent um, people from getting their power disconnected in some places uh, for lack of payment. Um, we uh, think that that should be also extended to the hot season. Um, because we know that air conditioning is one of the fundamental ways in which people avoid uh, illnesses or death from extreme heat. And lastly, we also uh, have a need to keep workers safe from extreme heat. There are um, there's uh, so some recent um, action uh, legislative action introduced in the House. Um, the Asuncion Valdivia Heat Illness and Fatality Prevention Act of 2019. Um, um, after a 53-year-old man called Asuncion Valdivia died in 2004 or so after spending 10 hours uh, picking grapes in a field um, under a heat of 105 or so. Um, and so there are some of these, some, some ways that these uh, uh, national occupational safety standards can be um, improved and enacted to protect uh, farm workers from heat. So how are some of the ways that you can help? As Christy mentioned, um, we have developed congressional district fact sheets for all 433 congressional districts in the, um, in the, in the lower 48 uh, that show what the impacts from our, um, from our study are projected to be in those uh, congressional districts. You can reach out to your members of Congress. You can write um, LTEs. Um, you can attend public forums. You can also text HEAT to the number below um, for more resources. We have a host of other uh, resources that we, can, uh, that we can help provide, such as the widget that Christy mentioned earlier and the link to our interactive map. Next slide, it's a little bit slow. Uh, oops, excuse me, there we go. Um, okay, I think that's uh, all that I have. Um, I think we probably want to open it up for questions or some closing remarks. Yeah, and, and real quick, thank you, Juan and Chrissy. That was um, a great presentation. It's um, you know alarming to see the, the um, impacts of um, from extreme heat that is projected without any action, but positive to see um, some opportunity for nurses to get involved in, and take some action to help you know reverse the trajectory that we are on. Um, in addition to um, the action items offered by um, the Union of Concerned Scientists, I also wanted to add in an action um, alert that Annie is working on. It's, um, we are doing some advocacy around a forthcoming 100% clean energy bill that is um, said to be introduced into the House, um, likely in September by Congressman McEachin. And we pulled together an action alert that nurses can use to um, send a message to their 
um, House representatives asking them to co-sponsor the bill and asking um, to make sure that um, renewable energy is um, a, a component of the, the clean energy bill. So if you, um, I'll type this link into the chat box as well, but you can go ahead and, and follow that link and there'll be an action alert, which you can send a message, you can edit the message, or you can leave it as is and send it to your House representative. Um, so with that, I will just open it up. If anyone has some questions, just a reminder, please go ahead and enter them in the chat box at the left-hand corner of your screen. Um, and so we don't have... Uh, uh, this is, sorry, this is one. So while, while any questions that may come in do come in, I'd like to mention something because somebody mentioned, Jackie said, I am so glad you're bringing in the health disparities part. That, um, that is uh, a part that's very important to us um, and that we are planning on, on conducting follow-on analysis to try to understand um, what those disparities may look like um, um, based on on, on on the future climate conditions. Um, um, but we thought that it would be important to establish a lot of the basic climate science first um, and then take on that because we think that's a key. Uh, the inequities present in extreme heat vulnerabilities and extreme heat, um, basically death and illness rates, um, are a very important part of the picture and can be overlooked if we are going to um, be able to solve uh, this problem in an equitable way. Thank you, Juan. Um, as people are, are typing in their questions, I did have um, a quick question. Could you explain a little bit, and I'll put your presentation back up. Could you explain a little bit more about um, some of the interactive maps and the resources that you have um, that, you know, nurses in different states can utilize to bring some of this information to their um, members of Congress. You want to take that, Christy? Sure, I can take that. Um, mm -hmm. So we do, I think our fact sheets are probably the best place um, if you're going to your member of Congress to ask them about their um, plans to deal with climate change or their um, plans to deal with extreme heat in your district. Um, I, right now, I will put our website URL back in the, um, in the box so that everyone can see that. Um, just give me a second, I'll pull it up, and you can, you'll be able to see um, links to the interactive mapping tools. And one of those is for um, congressional districts. So uh, let me just type that in there. Um, if you go to that website, you'll first see um, an interactive map for county level data, which is useful and many um, congressional representatives are, are interested in and they know the counties they represent, right? So you can take that data to them. Or if you wanted to print out a fact sheet, if you scroll down a little bit on that um, website, you'll come to an interactive map that doesn't really have any data behind it. But if you find your congressional district, it will direct you to, um, when you click on it, you will have a link to download a fact sheet for that district. Um, we do have um, fact sheets available in English or Spanish, all of them downloadable from that website. And what the fact sheets look like is um, they're pretty basic. Uh, the data that's presented is specific for that congressional district. And it shows the number of days um, above different heat index thresholds of 90, 100, or 105 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and how that changes from historical through mid-century to late century, and how taking action could limit the number of days of extreme heat in that district. There's also on the back page of um, that fact sheet, and it's just a, it's a front and back, just really short. Um, there's a summary of some of the national level results. Uh, many of the things that I talked about in my part of the presentation are included in there and a summary of the different types of um, policy solutions that we would hope that um, local, state, and federal policymakers would adopt. Excellent. Thank you, Christy. Um, we have a question also on, um, is there any information on energy blackouts with increased heat? 
such as electrical grid, no power. Yeah, so we do talk about this a little bit in our report, how extreme heat can both cause these um, sort of chain reaction events like blackouts um, and can also be exacerbated by other things like uh, you just have a hurricane hit that knocks out power and then that's followed by a heat wave. Um, you can have negative health impacts there as well. Um, it's something that we're hoping to explore further in the coming year. And we also have a number of um, blog posts about it at the UCS blog, um, which you can find at, I'll type that URL into. Um, yeah, I think that, that's, uh, a really, that, that's, a really good, that's a really good question because if you, I mean, if, if you have, so those double, triple whammy, you know, type of events, like say you have a hurricane in the middle of the summer, and then, and then the power goes out, and then you have a heat wave after the hurricane. I mean, that could put a lot of people in harm's way. Uh, just another question about environmental justice. That's the um, question about um, what environmental justice organizations are you aware of who might be interested in partnering with nurses in, um, Jessica refers to the recent national platform released on climate justice. Mm -hmm. um, well, I can think of a couple of different groups and organizations that we could um, that that uh, could be um, interested. Um, there are some partner organizations um, in the Northeast, such as um, We Act for Environmental Justice, which is focused on in in, in New York City and Lower Manhattan. Um, there are others, uh, probably the Just Transition Alliance in, in, in California, who works on a host of environmental justice issues related to climate. Um, let's see. Um, there are, mo most of the organizations that I can think of are based in cities. You know, there are, for example, the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization in, um, in Chicago um, may, may be interested. Um, Thank you, Juan. Uh, another question here is, do the, do the models for slow action take into account exacerbating factors like plant die-offs due to heat, fires, et cetera? They unfortunately don't. So um, the, the models are both very sophisticated, but also kind of simple at the same time. And they can't, um, they don't have feedbacks for things like if all the, the trees die in a forest fire, for example, um, and then you don't have that, that tree cover providing shade, that kind of thing isn't included in the, um, in the models and in the scenarios we used, unfortunately. Oh, and another question here. Um, are there plans for OSHA to push for compliance in 2019 for heat illness impacts for at-risk populations? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that one. Juan, do you? I think there are some bills, you know, uh, hang on a second. There is a an OSHA outdoor worker heat bill that I believe it's being introduced shortly um probably in the house um, um there are already osha guidelines that f uh, for outdoor workers that follow the, the the heat index right christy there are but right now there's no national standard for those um and so it's very hard to enforce those guidelines they're mostly like major effort underway. Yeah. Are, aren't they mostly like best business practices type thing, you know, not 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 something that's enforceable. Um, yeah, they're, they're difficult to enforce because it's covered under OSHA's general duty clause, which states that an employer has a general duty to provide a safe working environment. Um, and so there aren't specific standards around heat, um, but there is legislation that's been introduced, um, as Juan had mentioned in his presentation, to try to uh, get a standard in place so that it's much more enforceable. 
And do you, does the Union of Concerned Scientists have any information on their website um, relating to the the um, worker protection bill? Mm, I'm not sure I can follow up on that. Okay. Um, like, wait, yeah. Wait. Well, we got a, a slew of questions here, so I'll start with Janice's. Um, can you comment on a, the effect of increased ice melt in change in permafrost, creating less reflection of sun's heat and thereby triggering additional melt? Sure. So this is something that's called the um, ice albedo feedback. So right now, mm -hmm. if we think of a place like the Arctic that's covered in um, bright white ice, that white ice reflects a lot of sunlight back into the atmosphere. The more we melt that ice, the less of that reflective surface we have. And what it gets replaced with is a dark ocean. And so we, um, in those cases, uh, or when that happens, we are absorbing more heat from the sun. Um, and that then speeds up warming. Um, so that's part of the reason why warming is more significant or has been more significant historically in the Arctic than it has um, at lower latitudes. Great, thank you. Um, another question relating to policy. Um, what is the best way to speed up policy implementation of actions like cooling standards for public housing, especially in populations in the southeast region? Um, well, I'll give you an example from my experiences in, in the Northeast. Um, I think the best way that those have worked out, the, the most effective way has been by partnering with local um, advocate organizations, in this case, the environmental justice organization that is active in the policy space that has, um, uh, does a lot of community engagement and develops climate action plans that, that basically um, uh, talks to the, to, to the constituents, to the, to the people that they represent, and they come up, uh, they have a full participatory type of um, type, type of uh, plan um, or way, way of engaging, um, um, to then turn those concerns into policy proposals that can be uh, taken to all levels of government, to, uh, you know, from the city level, uh, to the county, to, to state, uh, ultimately, I guess, to state legislators is where, is where they will need to go. Um, so that so that those standards are 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 codified and put in place um, to have uh, to to protect people. Um, I think that's what I've seen that has um, uh, that has worked out. But it requires partnership between many different kinds of professionals and 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 just and, and, and people residents. Excellent example. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Um, a question from Jessica. Since we've been talking a lot about um, national policy, um, Jessica asked, can you point to any good city, county, or state plans that effectively plan for heat um, impacts? I've seen, um, I, I know from Arizona because I did a lot of my work there and I stay in touch with what is being done in the county, and the Maricopa County, where Phoenix Metro is, and at the state level, where researchers from um, Arizona State University are, uh, you know, climatologists and geographers and others and other researchers are working together with public health, county, and state folks to develop heat adaptation plans to conduct scientific research that can help them identify when the heat season starts, when they start seeing the uptick in hospitalizations, 911 calls, deaths, and so on, um, working together with the local National Weather Service um, office there, um, and uh, even evaluating the uh, how how useful and uh, how well cited um, cooling centers are, and what other sorts of of, of buildings can be used to um, uh, to to put cooling centers in to make them useful for the most vulnerable populations. I would also add that. Philadelphia has a very robust um, heat warning system for its residents that's been in place for enough years that um, there's there are some studies showing the the benefit to the community of having this plan, these plans in place. So that would be one place um, if you're on the East Coast 
that would be worth looking into as well. And I thought I saw a question come in from Nancy, um, but I'm not seeing it pop up. I don't know, Juan or Christy, if you're if you're seeing a question from Nancy pop up on your end there. No, no. no okay. I'm not. No, I see another one from Carol. Though. Okay. So Nancy, if you did have a question to ask, do you mind re-entering it? Um, because we're not able to see what the question is. But we'll move on to Carol's question as we wait for yours to come in. Um, can you speak to heat impacts on food production for both productions, um, slow action and rapid action? Also, is there data on the link between heat um, and conflict or violence? And can you comment on your thoughts about potential impacts due to heat with both projections? Sure. So um, I should start by saying that we haven't looked at these both of these topics, food production and, and conflict or violence, specifically with this study. Um, one thing that is a little bit different about the work that we've done compared to the food production piece is that we were looking at heat index, which is really um, tailored to human health, whereas um, food production is often more sensitive just to temperature on its own rather than a combined temperature humidity metric. Um, that said, there are projections that show um, that climate change would have a negative impact on food production, both in terms of crops and livestock. Um, there's some really striking statistics, for instance, about um, dairies in particular. Um, and I can't, rem I don't know the, the numbers offhand. I'd be happy to follow up if you're interested. But um, they look at how much the average dairy in the U.S. loses due to climate-related factors today and then um, project that that would increase really notably in the future. Um, things like, you know, animals become more stressed when it's hot and also milk production goes down. Um, we also know that the workers who are um, out there harvesting our crops would have reduced productivity in a hotter climate as well. Um, so, okay, so that was food production. Um, if we look at the link between conflict and violence, we know that when there's a heat wave, it's not only ER admissions that, um, that spike, but there are also spikes in um, crime. And that, you know, I think many of us, when it's extremely hot, feel increasingly irritable and that does play out in terms of um, incidents that involve the police and um, criminal activity. At the broader scale, there's a lot of discussion among scientists about whether warming and climate change has, uh, is, um, is causing increased conflict at you know, not just an interpersonal scale, but a country level scale. And there's some, some indications, um, for example, in Syria that shows that a lot of the conflict there followed a period, a severe period of drought. Um, and it may not have been the drought on its own that, um, that led to that conflict, but you know, the government's response to it, a lack of support for people affected by it, that leads to um, a population that is really hurting. And so there's, you know, whether there's a causal link between any given conflict um, and climate is always, um, you know, something you have to assess on, on an incident by incident basis. Um, but we do know at least at the local level that we see those strong signals um, in that link heat and violence. And I think a question that goes along with it, I, I was able to, to see all your questions now. Sorry about that. I, there has been a bit of a buildup here. Um, does the model include analysis of human migration from our south resulting from even more extreme heat near the equator? We did not account for migration. Um, in our public facing materials, um, the report materials that you'll see linked to on that website, um, we didn't um, model any changes in population or distribution in where people live um, because it's uncertain how people in hot places like Florida would cope with 
um, much more frequent and severe heat. Some people may choose to leave. Maybe people would become acclimatized to it. There are a lot of individual choices and community level choices that will be made. Um, at that same website, you can see a link to our peer reviewed publication in environmental research communications, where we do include um, population change scenarios. Um, and these aren't specifically related to migration. Um, they're, they're based on global scenarios um, that model global population growth and change um, throughout the world. So you can get a sense of um, how the change in population would affect the number of people who would be affected by extreme heat in a given year. Okay, um, a couple more questions. Um, Teddy, yes, we will have, um, be able to send you the slides. Um, a question, the question from Nancy, um, when so many policy decisions are made based on political jurisdictions, what advice do you offer for places that will not be so immediately or as severely affected by climate change? Um, for example, those that may benefit in the near term because of improved agricultural production or receiving um, climate um, refugees from other states? Juan, would you, are you, I can um, take this um, one, but I feel like I've been talking a lot. <laughs> well, I'd like to know also what, what Chrissy thinks, but I, I, I would say that the, the limited benefits that some regions may receive from climate change will probably not, out, will not outweigh the detrimental impacts that it will have on the rest of the other, even, you know, human or ecological systems in that same place, you know, health, agriculture, health, agriculture, production, infrastructure, um, um, the ability of, of a city to deliver, to deliver services or something like that. I, I don't know, Christy, if you have a different take on that. Yeah, I would say that in one form or another, Almost every place in the U.S. will be dealing with climate change um, in the next 40 years or so. Um, you know, whether that manifests itself as extreme heat or more frequent extreme precipitation, um, it's you'd be hard pressed to find a place that is climate proof. Um, but if you are a place like Maine, for example, where you might benefit from having a longer tourism season or a slightly longer growing season, um, you know, I would, I would just note that, you know, we, while decisions do get made at the local level, the, the decisions that get made at, um, at a community that's far from yours could impact your community um, indirectly. Um, it also speaks to, you know, whether we have an obligation to be looking out for people in parts of the country where we don't live. Um, you know, does it, how do we as a country approach, um, approach the health and safety of all people in the U.S., not just our immediate neighbors? Um, and so if you feel like you're in a place that won't be as affected by extreme heat in the near term, but this is an issue you care about, I would say, you know, start um, thinking about those federal policies that you could be advocating for that would help to protect everyone. Um, and maybe it's not your, um, you know, your local state senator that you would be approaching about um, local policies that you'd like to see enacted, but go to your state senators, uh, go to your congressional representatives so that they can start advocating for those things um, in Washington. Thank you so much. Um, and we're almost at the hour, so I'm just going to um, allow you to, to give any closing comments that you might have for us. And, and maybe if you want to touch on how nurses can help um, amplify this report, the findings of the report, and some of the actions you all have recommended. Um, I would say that you know, nurses are really in some ways on the front lines of some of these health impacts. You know, you're going to be the ones who are fielding more, um, more patients coming in with heat-related illnesses um, or heat stroke. 
And so if these are things that you, you care about, you know, you're a powerful group. You um, can, because you see this more directly than many people in the country, including some of us scientists, right? So I would say just to be thinking about your collective power and if there are policies that you, um, you would like to start advocating for to, to organize around those and do so. Yeah, I, I would echo that. And I would also add um, that nurses rank among the most trusted um, professionals among the public in poll after poll, alongside doctors and other medical professionals. And and so that, you know, you guys are in a, in a, in a, in a like Christy said, in a, in a, I guess in a privileged position to be able to communicate, to see this, to understand this um, firsthand, and to also be able to communicate to people that these things are happening and that they are real. Um, coming from a trusted messenger, such as yourselves, may um, help us um, mobilize the public and get to where we need to get to, to avoid the worst. Well, thank you so much, Juan and Christy, for this presentation and for taking the time out to speak with our committee. Um, everyone, just remember, look out for an email tomorrow with an evaluation um, and information how you can get your nursing um, continuing education, as well as a link to the recording and slide presentations. Um, thank you all for joining.